Welcome back. Well, advances in technology today now allow us to have robotic-assisted anti-reflux surgery. And today I have Dr. William Wallace, who is the Medical Director of General Surgery at Memorial Care Saddleback Medical Center to talk about it. Well, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, before we get started, let's go ahead and hear about your background and, and how this came to be with you assist using the robotic system. Sure. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a local kid. I grew up in Tustin, California. I played uh, football at Servite High School, one of my proudest achievements. <laughs> I went to University of California, Riverside, University of Vermont for medical school, and fortunate enough to come back to UCI where I did my surgical training, where it was really just the frontier experimentation in robotic surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I was a general surgeon. I came to Saddleback 15 years ago. I was very fortunate to be able to stay close to my family. And within the last five or six years, robotic surgery for anti-reflux surgery um, has really come along to, originally I thought it was an alternative to the laparoscopic surgery that I have been doing for 15, 20 years and to, to the point where I believe and I, I believe the research is showing is actually better oh, operation than wow. laparoscopic with better okay. outcomes, certainly more elegant and it's more fun to do. As more a surgeon. fun to do. Yep. Oh, and, wow. and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm really happy with the results that I've been seeing which is the reason that I'm here today. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the conditions that would lead to possibly needing this type of surgery. Sure. I think most of the people that I operate on um, have reflux and have hiatal hernias. And I think we talked to a bunch of people, in fact, I was just talking to your vice president outside, oh, hope oh, there's not confidentiality violation there, was telling me, hey, I have a hiatal hernia, but I, I'm not experiencing it. I didn't even know I had a hiatal hernia. A lot of people have that and they don't need to do anything about it. It mm -hmm. just means that part of the stomach has popped up into your chest. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as um, that exacerbates, people get reflux. Okay. And hey, now I'm taking protonics, I take some myelanta and I'm doing okay, great. You're fine. You don't mm -hmm. need to do anything. Mm -hmm. It's the people that are having really bad reflux. So I, people I've operated on recently is spontaneous vomiting. They have reflux at night. They have to sleep almost straight up. Gets wow. into their throat. <clears> throat> <clears throat> Chronic cough the next day. And a lot of my patients have adult asthma. And in my opinion, and this is, you know, I don't think medically found or approved, but I've seen a strong association with adult asthma and reflux. Mm. And when I operate on people and we fix the reflux, the adult asthma goes away. Right. So my patients, the people that we would operate on, shortness of breath, uh, chronic coughing, protonics doesn't work anymore, pain, spontaneous vomiting, things like that. Um, there is a role for operating on people who just don't want to take medications for the rest of their life, and I think that's right. very reasonable right. um, as well. Is there something in the body that's actually causing the reflux? I mean, why do you start out with a hiatal hernia first? Sure. Um, I have a great picture um, that we'll show later. Okay. But it boils down to this. Um, when you eat food, the, the pressure in your chest is always higher than the pressure in your belly, in your abdomen. So when you eat food, it goes down your esophagus, bloop, pops into your stomach, and it stays there. Okay. I tell people it's just like a restaurant that has a fan and the flies in the restaurant. Once it flies out, <laughs> fly goes away and can't get back in. Right. That's just the way that you're built dynamically and physiologically when you're born. Okay. Pops in the stomach. When the diaphragm opens up a little bit and the stomach pops up into your chest just a little bit, there is no valve, there is no pressure zone, and it's a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. And that's how people get reflux. And mm -hmm. Risk factors are chronic coughing, heavy lifting, straining for bowel movements, uh, liver disease, and just getting older. Oh, okay. When we get older, our tissues just aren't as strong as they were when we were 20. Right, right. Okay, well let's talk about the surgery itself and how um, a robotic uh, mechanism is now assisting you. And I know we have some pictures, so we'll go ahead and take a look at that and you can sure. walk us through it. Um, that's a great picture. Um, I think if we were to go 20 years ago, we would have a big up and down decision about this big, bunch of retractors, right. fixing it. Um, and that, that was quite a deterrent for people. Now we're doing it laparoscopically. When I do it laparoscopically, I make about the same incisions, about eight millimeters, sometimes 10 millimeters. Mm -hmm. I have an assistant on a high definition camera doing our, instrument, doing our instruments. When I do it laparoscopically, the instruments I have can do this. They open and close. Wow. And I'm looking at a two dimensional view. If you tried to do it, you would say, how did you do that? That's amazing, right. 2D. And, just over the years, I can see two-dimensionally, and I know how to manipulate the instruments. Now, are you are you doing that by looking at a screen, or do you have something on your head that helps Great you question. see it? Great um, question. I'm looking at a monitor, so if I were operating okay. on the patient, I would be looking at this. I'd be looking at the high-definition monitor, using my instruments, asking my partner to move the camera and look around. Okay. Robotically, 
inside the body, instead of having, you know, pinchers, I have endo wrists. Oh, wow. And the robot can move around. And if you watched me on the robot, you would, you'd be watching me. I would be doing this. It would look like I was doing some kind of yoga class. <laughs> but if you looked at the robot, the robot would be doing one millimeter right. highly precision maneuvers, mm -hmm. allows me to suit your front hand, bow hand, mm -hmm. tie, mm -hmm. really get great visualization. It's 3D. If I put you on the robot, you could probably do it. I'd wow. have to coach you through it. Yeah. And we'd have to get your malpractice, which <laughs> yeah, might be for tough. Sure. <laughs> um, but, but you could do it and, and, and you, would, you would like it. How much training was involved? Well, it's really, so I would say it's my surgical training, which is four years of medical school, six years of training, and at this point I have 15 years. Right. Um, under my belt. So it's the same operation I'm doing with just different tools. So okay. to get used to doing the tools, I had to go out to the um, San Jose where they have the robot center, um, Intuitive Surgical, which the stock is doing amazing. I'm not, everyone says it's peaked out. I don't know. I'm not giving any stock advice. <laughs> but it's definitely a well run company. They've put a lot of money in investing and they're well trained and they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So you go to the facility, you work on the robot, we work on a animals. Um, and then you come back and you work on the patients with a proctor, somebody okay. watching you, which is which right. is what I've which is what I've done. I've probably done about, I'm guessing, 75 to maybe 100 robotic operations at this point. Great. Um, and I feel so. I think the learning curve is about 20 or 30. But I've done so many hiatal hernias that putting the robot just actually just a transition right. more than learning. Right. Yeah. I would right. say it's more adapting than learning. Right. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide because that way you can tell us sure. how this works. Sure. Um, so this picture right here would be the end product. When we start off, the stomach is up in the chest and what you can see here is there's stitches closing the diaphragm. That's the diaphragm. Before the stitches are there, you can imagine the diaphragm was wide open and the stomach was popped up into the chest and I think we'll see that picture. So what I do is I pull the stomach back down into the abdomen, mm -hmm. I close the defect, and then I take the stomach and I wrap it around itself. Oh wow. Um, and that creates a valve. Okay. So you can imagine as the stomach inflates or gets um, insufflated with food, it transduces pressure and it creates a valve. And this was discovered by accident in France, huh. I'm going to guess 50 to, uh, 50 to 70 years ago. A young man had a perforated ulcer, the surgeon pulled it down, didn't know how to close the ulcer, he wrapped the stomach around it, that was it. Wow. Turns out the kid had horrible reflux his whole life, mm -hmm. and then afterwards his reflux was gone. So they put two and two together and they figured out, hey, maybe this, maybe we we're onto something here. Okay, all right, great. What's now? Well, uh, so yeah, so this is a great picture. This is kind of a systematic on how we do it. So this is the hiatal hernia where part of your stomach is popped up into your chest and you can see the defect in the diaphragm is pretty big. I pull it down, I fix the defect. So it looks oh. like it did when you were 20. Then I take the stomach and I wrap it around itself and right. I create the valve. Okay. And just by bringing the stomach into the abdomen changes the pressure zone. Right. So the food goes there and stays there. Right. They created the valve, reinsures that. Okay. In surgery, we tried many different evolutions of the wrap, and it turns out that that's still the best, okay. the best way to do it. Okay. All right. And how long does the procedure take? It takes me from the time I actually get started, it takes me about two hours, sometimes an hour and a half okay. to two hours. Okay. All right. A little bit longer for more complicated. Um, this picture over here is an example of a hiatal hernia. Most of the patients I operate on, this part of the stomach. Half oh, of the stomach, the ha last, almost half of half it. Half of the stomach. The last patient wow. I operated on about 66% of the stomach, two thirds what was up in the chest. What about how they could eat anything? Yeah, how could you eat was, anything like yeah. that? Well, but she was having spontaneous vomiting. Oh, she sure. Yeah, she couldn't keep the food down. Oh, that's just awful. So, so she's done great. Now, is this procedure something that insurance would take care oh, of? Oh, absolutely. Okay. This is 100% medically indicated. Right. Um, we tend to get, one, we get people off of proton pump inhibitors, mm -hmm. right? which I, in general I believe is a safe medication. So, right. oh, I need to get off this. So I go, I, no, I think it's, well, I read this. No, I think in general it's still a pretty safe medication. Right. Okay. So if your medication's working really well for you, you don't need to see me. Right. I'm happy to talk to you about it. But, right. But we're probably not going to operate on you. Right. Um, and then a lot of times inhalers, their breathing gets better, shortness of breath gets better, activity mm -hmm. gets better. They can do more mm -hmm. um, walking and exercising, and then overall just healthier. And then what is the recovery time once you've had this surgery? Um, my patients, after I operate on them, I close all their incisions with a plastic surgery closure, mm -hmm. waterproof skin glue, no wound care necessary. Mm -hmm. Put a bunch of numbing medicine in the incision. I keep them overnight. Following morning, we do a swallowing study where they swallow the barium or, or gastrogastric. Oh, my favorite. 
<laughs> strawberry flavored. Oh, I bet. <laughs> um, goes down into the stomach, and I make sure that things are working well. There's no reflux. There's no injury. Mm -hmm. And then I send them home. Later that day, full liquids for two weeks. Okay. Anything that you can put through the blender, lattes, smoothies. Mm -hmm. um, I always say mashed potatoes dripping off the spoon. Right. Okay. And then after two weeks, they send me in the office, and I advance them to a soft diet, soft mechanical diet. Cottage cheese, scrambled eggs, tuna salad. Right. And then after six weeks, you can eat whatever you want. And then, and then I pretty much have everybody fortify small meals okay. the rest of it, which is actually the way all of us we should We should eat. do it anyway, fortify exactly. Small meals. Yeah, dinner should be the smallest meal for everybody. Right. Load up early in the day. Oh, now I'm a nutritionist. Now I'm a nutritionist. Load up early in the day, lunch, small dinner. Right. And then projected for the rest of their life it will last? Or? Good question. Um, the main reason that I actually am here today, so in general, I wouldn't go around talking about, uh, I'd love to, if people want me to, I will, but I wouldn't call them and go, hey, I need to talk about this. Right. This operation has an 80% long-term success rate. Okay. 80%. Most of the operations that I do have 99 to 100. Okay, it's 80% long-term success rate. I would argue that my 20% failures, the people that fail, are still a lot better than they were before. Right. They're just not perfect. Right. So sometimes it's disappointing after surgery, like, this is fantastic, I'm doing great. Mm -hmm. And then and then it comes back, they get a little bit of reflux. That would be a failure, but they're still better than they were. They're not having spontaneous vomiting. I think part of the problem is the people that aren't doing as well are the ones that keep coming back. They come right. to the GI doctors, the primary care doctors, and then the GI doctors and primary care doctors often say, don't do it, it's right. a bad operation. Mm. What they don't know is that 90% of the people that are doing great don't come back. But when you look at the numbers and you look at the statistics, it's a very good operation with the low complication rate um, and, a, and a good success rate and improves quality of life. Sounds amazing. I mean, technology today, it's been, it's really advancing quickly. Yeah, it's really, it's a great tool for us as surgeons. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you telling us of the information. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have any questions about this particular surgery, go to memorialcare.org forward slash GERD. And we'll be right back after this. Thank you.